<laughs> Hi guys, welcome. Thanks so much for coming today. We're really excited. Full Sail's very excited to um, be hosting a visit from Cheryl Ann Martin. And um, just to tell you a little bit about Cheryl Ann Martin, she is a, an executive producer who's been responsible for the management and production of some of the most memorable feature films and television productions of the past um, few years. Um, from HBO's award-winning miniseries, The Pacific, to Academy Award winner Forrest Gump, Ms. Martin has collaborated with some of the biggest names in the entertainment industry, such as Rob Reiner, Robert Zemeckis, Jodie Foster, Robin Williams, uh, Michael Douglas, Mar uh, Martin Sheen, and Tom Hanks. Um, and she's worked her way up to producer working on films such as Castaway, Road to Perdition, Nancy Drew, Get Smart, Superman Returns, Constantine, Miss Congeniality 2, What Lies Beneath, and Contact, among others. The list goes on and on, but I will watch a small, a short clip. So anyway, let's introduce uh, Miss Cheryl Ann Martin. Thank you, Paul Sale, for having me. So Cheryl Ann, I, I heard that you're a local girl. Can you tell us where you grew up? I am a local girl. And went to school, uh, college at FSU, Florida State. And yeah. did you study film, or what did you study? I did not study film. I, film was not on my radar. Um, I studied advertising and marketing, and that was my major. And I had um, an internship with William & Morris in Chicago on my senior year in college, and I was just a few weeks out before I left, and at the 11th hour, my professor said, yeah, I'm not so sure you're a corporate kind of gal. And so literally two weeks before they shipped me to San Francisco to do a advertising internship at a really small company. And when I was there, this very small company had their first movie that they were going to produce. So about a month into my advertising internship, they asked if I could um, work on the film with them. I think I was like 19, 19 years old, never been west of the Mississippi. And I called FSU back, they said, go for it, write a journal. And so that became my first experience in filmmaking at, at 19 years old. What film was it? Street music. Um, it was actually a true story. Um, it's a woman director who was a protege of Francis Ford Coppola. And um, so my first film was with a woman director, which oh, I thought... very cool. Yeah, very, very cool. cool. Um, and what was it about what you were doing at uh, William Morris that kind of made them want to have you work on the film? I mean, was there... Uh, I, we, I think that there's two spots at William and Morris, and it was... Um, that was an advertising internship, and the internship I ended up taking was a small boutique company. So when I was at the small boutique company and this first movie started. Um, they kind of needed a little bit of everything. So I started as a production assistant, craft service. I was a stand-in. I helped the, the caterer. I took the film to the lab. I picked up people at the airport. I was an extra. I picked up day-old donuts. <laughs> I did everything, as, and um, you know, from the ground up, I've probably had almost every job in the production realm. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So was it after that first experience that you sort of went, wow, this is something I, I want to do, or when? Uh, you know, I was still fairly young. Um, I came back, I did my second movie in Los Angeles, still under an internship um, in Francis Ford Coppola's One from the Heart. Uh, if you're a real movie buff, you might know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back, graduated from FSU, had an internship in Miami um, for television. And then I was just, I was a little bit of a rolling rock because, you know, when you're that young without any formal education, like all of you uh, students here getting this amazing education, I didn't have any of that with film. So I didn't have the experience. I just had my advertising intern, my you know my college education, which mm -hmm. did not did not cross over with film at all. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of starting out from the beginning without any experience, mm -hmm. and um, it just little by little, 
I was a production assistant for many years. If anyone noticed Jaws 3 back in the, um, yeah. which was shot in Orlando, I was on that for about a year here in Orlando. And that was really my last time I've, worked in, I've lived in Orlando. But for years, I was a set PA. Um, I worked in the office a little bit, but that wasn't really kind of, I ended up being on the set. I was an extras coordinator wow. um, for a couple of years, and I was just kind of drifted through. I lived in Dallas a little bit after we did Jaws. There was a lot of crew that lived in Dallas and ended up in Dallas. And it, when I was about 25, I think, I had accumulated enough production days to get in the Director's Guild, um, uh, the DGA, which I'm not sure if all of you know, um, which back then I didn't really realize how invaluable that tool would be for me because I was a little on the young side to be thinking about, you know, health insurance and mm -hmm. pension. Um, I moved to New York and I lived in New York for several years and then finally made it out to Los Angeles you know, I think I was about 30, and um, I started as a second assistant director and kept working in that realm. Skipped over being a first. I did if I had to, but it wasn't, wasn't my strength to yeah. talk in front of a lot of people. <laughs> really? <laughs> so that's kind of how I just stumbled into show biz. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But what was it ab about show business that, that really kind of drew you in those first couple of jobs? Because well, it's such a tough, it, especially PA, you know, it's... Um, it's pretty relentless, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's just... Uh, y y Every day was different. Um, the days are long, but every day, you know, with the film, it mixes up. So, if you are not destined to be sitting behind a desk um, and to put your jeans and sneakers and your hat on and your cold weather gear or your rain gear or whatever element that you're in, and you know, meet new people every day, and the experiences I've had over the last 30 years have been pretty incredible. And uh, places I've been, and it's not glamorous. I mean, there are glamorous moments along the way, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a tough business, you know, physically. Um, uh, you have to have an endurance, it's a bit of an endurance test. And um, I just love the mixed up of it all, and the yeah. travel, and which sometimes bites you on the back end when you don't want to travel anymore, and Mm -hmm. Or you want to travel in your terms, not their terms. And, um, and just being outdoors a lot, um, which I love being outdoors. And I know a lot of uh, students in here are into um, you know, the, more in the post elements, which I applaud you because I, that's not my strength. I'm into production. And uh, I just, you know, loved meeting the people and the experiences and the stories. And not every film you do will speak to you um, as much as some others. And that makes the ones you do that you love even more, more valuable mm -hmm. to experience, you know, to appreciate the, the really ones that are getting, you know, knocked out of the um, ballpark, you know. Wow. Well, what do you think has lent itself to your longevity in the industry? What does it, what, is it... Um, is it that you changed and kind of were growing in your positions, or what do you feel has been the reason why you've been doing this for? Well, I mean, I think it's part of your, must put like your DNA, because you have to be a little bit of a rolling rock um, yeah. and uh, flexible, um, because things, I mean, you, you travel so much and um, your hours are long. And I think it's a lot about the people you surround yourself with, and um, and it's it's fun. I mean, it's hard. It's hard work. I mean, it's and it's not easy work, um, but it's it's exciting and yeah. um, watching it all come together. And mm -hmm. when you're standing out there at five o'clock in the morning, and you've got you know it's starting to build and the momentum and. And some of you know the bigger work, or being there on some really subtle scenes, and just all of a sudden going, this might be something really incredible, and you're kind of all in it together. And then yeah. it's then it's over. It's um, um, you know you stand next to people all day uh, for months and months and months, six seven days a week, and then those doors close, and then the next film you may not see this group or two out of hundred, mm -hmm. and 
some people you never see again and some you, you know, build lifelong relationships with. And mm -hmm. and I, 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 it, to me, it always feels a little bit like camp when you get back together yes. with people that yes. you work, you know, so much with and then you don't see them for a while and then you go back and it's yes. like going to summer camp again. Very much so, very much so. Yeah. And then you have your favorites. And then as you elevate into more of a producing situation, you are able to try to keep your favorites um, mm -hmm. close, if possible. I mean, every film is different and every film doesn't appeal to everybody and the timing. So much of uh, what we do is timing. Yeah. It could be on or it could be off. It, you, you'll hit both of them. Yeah. So what, what do you feel are the most important skills to being a filmmaker? What is it that those, what kind of skills do you look for when you're hiring people or um, that you've had to sort of uh, uh, grow over the years? Uh, that, you know, that's so specific to each um, category, each department. Um, I think we, we've all, we all get our breaks, you know, and or, or hopefully we all get our breaks. Um, so not every, the most experienced person that walks in the room is the best person for the job. Um, experience is really invaluable. I mean, I didn't have a college education in film. Um, so what all of you are walking away with is like incredible because it's a really truncated time to get a lot of experience in a 20 month period mm -hmm. to pack it in, and I'm sure everyone of you know a lot more than I do, and all the fancy technical things going on back here. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, uh, to, to keep it in perspective, it's, you know, it is entertainment, it is film. Um, there's probably a hundred people behind you that want your job, um, and that would be willing to do it as well, and uh, to be flexible and uh, easy to work with and I mean still have your you know your opinion in your grounds and keep your ethics in check um, but it's it's kind of cutthroat a little bit out there and um, and if I mean it, the bar is set high and it, it, I mean even to this day I mean, you know, to be grateful for every job that comes through because there's a writer strike, there's a SAG strike, there's someone striking the ball, you know, the sea change is just so every, sh you know, every project that you actually get mm -hmm. is kind of a small victory, even after all these years. It, they don't, it's not a for sure, it's not given. That brings up a good point. Um, would you say, even though these are, you know, major, major, m large films that you've worked on, would you say that in general, what's the time frame from when you get asked about doing something, if, if a film actually goes into production, what's the time frame usually on that for pre-production? Um, on the larger ones, I'm usually, I, well, I've been on a couple of these projects for a couple of years, um, depending, there, I mean, just gotta be flexible. I mean, I think on Contact, I was on it for two years, because wow. I went through two directors, so we were up and down. There's a lot of this in film business, you're up, you're down. Um, Realistically, on, a, uh, on a, a large movie, usually it's about a year of, uh, of from start to finish. I don't do post. I mean, I've done a little bit of post. Um, I'll sometimes babysit it while I'm doing a couple of other things, but that's usually turned over to a post producer. Mm. Okay. And I'm on the front end, uh, not the back end. Um, not a lot of producers do both ends. Um, unless they're at a creative with the director, and mm -hmm. um, I'm more mechanical production. Um, on the smaller films, maybe, you know, eight months, ten months. Mm -hmm. And how, uh, just in general, uh, just to give the, you know, the students here an idea of how many projects get started and then don't actually go into production? Yeah, I've done that, a lot of those, too. <laughs> you all will. Um, no, there's a, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of... Um, time and energy and money put into projects that do not go. I've been on my fair share, and I think everybody has. So, uh, and you can get the, pull, you know, the plug pulled a week into it, two months out, and it always, you know, you always need to prepare. You know, people always say, well, you're green lit now, but that they can still pull the plug when they're green lit because it's their, you know, it's the studio's money. So a lot of projects go a long way into um, development. I think I was on Superman, I don't know, through two directors. That went on for years wow. and years. I know Forrest Gump was around 
for years before it actually took life. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Years. It went through six directors. Do you often find yourself working on multiple projects then in different? Uh no, not not with not with what I do. Um, I can I can babysit a project if it's within the same studio system just to keep everyone on the same up, page, up up and board. Uh, yeah, it's not wise to do two different things like with my job because mine's pretty um, all-encompassing. I can babysit one if it's on the way out or needing, but it's hard, it's, it's hard to put too much more on my plate. Right. So talk a little bit about what you do because we all know that there's, you know, a million producers who are credited on a mm -hmm. film and a lot of our students know kind of what the differences are, but can you give us in broad strokes an idea about um, what you do specifically in the last couple of films and, you know, what the different roles are? Um, I'm usually brought on in the beginning to do a board and a budget, um, which they'll hand me a script, and uh, how many, like how much, and how, how and how much, basically. So that usually takes me about, if it's a medium-sized film, six weeks or so to take the script, break it down, schedule it with the director, mm -hmm. back and forth, and then whatever specifics from that particular film and then do a lot of you know research um, and whether it's period or you know, boats or planes or a foreign country or lang whatever the you know the genres of that film and then I work with an accountant um, to build a budget and to see kind of where it's hovering um, nowadays in the last five years um, Filmmakers are chasing incentives, um, which is where the money is in the states or in the countries to give back to the filmmakers for make, bringing their project. It's a huge sea change um, for the industry. Very few movies are made in California anymore. They are made outside of California where there is m more money. Unfortunately, California hasn't kind of figured quite that part out, but um, I used to be able to kind of pick and choose to work in LA if I wanted to, or if I wanted to travel. And now I would say 95% of the films are made outside of California. Wow. And they go into incentive states, which is uh, Louisiana, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida is getting there better, uh, Philadelphia, New York. And so I do a lot of scenarios with budget. So we'll take the plan and then we'll pivot it around the states or countries to see kind of what happens with the needle. Because now it's all about the bottom line for our filmmakers and studios is what their risk is. So how does that work? Would, would, do, the, do the studios come to you and say, okay, here's the script. Do you tell us how much approximately our lowest, our bottom line is for the budget? Or do, or do they come to you and say, okay, well, what we're thinking is about 10 million, make it work? Well, the, you, in the good old days, you used to tell them this is how much it cost. And now um, it's kind of like that, but they give you a target number or an, an idea. So at least you have an idea of what they're looking at. Um, and then you, you, you're never at the target. You always start up here and, <laughs> yeah. and you whittle, whittle and fight your way down until everyone's in a comfort zone. But I don't know if it's really ever comfortable, but right. it's a lot of money to keep track of. Uh, you, can, you, can you look at a script and kind of get a sense without even doing the budget what it'll cost? I mean, uh, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, you can at least, you can just see kind of, you know, the big action sequences, um, uh, what that entails, and if there's a lot of extras, period, which, you know, what the environments are, mm -hmm. um, how long the script is. All you script writers out there, don't make it too long. <laughs> Um, yeah, you could tell. Yeah. And, and, and visual effects is what drives most of the bigger films way up. And, and, the, amount, and the number of days that you shoot. Yeah. So you can kind of go, this feels like, you know, a medium-sized film, it's a 50-day shoot. Or if it's, you know, if it's a tentpole or a, a larger scale movie. You know, the, the, the movies are kind of being divided now. That are the tentpoles, the, you know, the sequels to mm -hmm. all the tentpoles. And then they're the random big movies. But... The genre that's kind of disappearing is um, between 60 and 90 million. That used to be a really comfortable number for Hollywood, which is not a comfortable number anymore. 
Uh, the tent poles are over here, and then most of the studios are looking to do much mm -hmm. um, smaller pictures. Um, and just to, it, it, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term tent pole, it, it, it's like the one big film, the biggest budget film that a studio is likely to make. The Batman, Spider-Man, yeah. the Avengers. And, and they tend to stick most of their budgets into yeah. that film for the year, or their budget fiscal year. So, very cool. And um, do you have a, uh, a favorite project that you've worked on? Um, or, or a group of favorite projects? Probably, when you're in them, they're all so hard. <laughs> Um, I would say probably uh, Forrest Gump was one of the more challenging ones because that was not a big budget movie, believe it or not. Um, and we were just on the move a lot. And mm -hmm. you could just see um, the story developing as the days went on. You could see that you know, this could be something special. Yeah. And we had a great crew. And, um, and it was just kind of whimsical, this you know, and uh, have had the great privilege to work with uh, Mr. Hanks on several projects, and he's just a delight. Um, and so that, and Castaway was was pretty adventurous. Where did you guys film Castaway? We were uh, in uh, Russia, Fiji, California, Texas, and Tennessee. And we split it in two, which you probably all know by now. Um, we split the movie in two, which everyone in Hollywood said, this will never happen. You can't do this. And we did it. We shot the first half of Castaway um, when uh, Mr. Hanks was uh, plump. <laughs> and <laughs> then we shot What Lies Beneath, which is another Robert Zemeckis movie, right on the heels oh of it, wow. which was um, Vermont. And so we went to the cast, it was Russia, and Russia, Fiji, LA. And then we basically put a small pen, told Tom to go lose a chunk of weight, and then we slid right into What Lies Beneath between Vermont and Los Angeles. Not the same crew, I mean, kind of a hybrid crew. Um, and then uh, we got out of that, we went right back to the second part of Castaway, which was back to Fiji, back to LA, oh Texas. Wow. And so I had these calendars around my office that, were, that took two and a half years, and, and we pretty much hit our mark. Wow. Yeah, it was two and a half years. I had a couple of days off. Um, <laughs> and it was big, two chunky movies with a lot of elements, and, uh, but we did it. So it sounds like you were working on two projects at once. Though. Well, that, that one was okay. It was the same director. Okay. Yeah, same director. <laughs> wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, how has the industry, we've talked a little bit about how the industry's um, been changing in, in the f sense that now we kind of chase, people chase the, those, um, those incentives. incentives. But how else have you seen, what major changes have you seen just happening in the way films are, um, the workflow of films and... I'd say probably the biggest technical change would be digital. Um, I haven't worked, well, it's, uh, very few films are actually 35 millimeter anymore. So the, that part of the, the, the daily part of filmmaking is much different as the technical, it's digital. And so the surrounding camera and post, you know, the workflow has changed. Mm -hmm. um, I am not convinced that it's less expensive. Everyone, it looks less expensive on paper. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you actually go through it, and there's a lot of hidden costs that aren't in the process. So I'm not quite sure today in my experience that it's, um, you know, it allows the film and the director and the filmmakers to, you know, really push out and explore their medium. I'm not mm -hmm. so sure financially, because there's a lot of hidden costs. But I, I think overall, Mm. Um, that's probably the biggest change. And the, the second biggest change, well, the first biggest change is uh, filmmaking in California is next to, n pretty much it's television. Wow. Yeah. I know we have a lot of people in the audience that are thinking when we graduate, head out to LA. Yeah, it's like you take the I-10, you get off <laughs> in Santa Monica. It's, and I, I can't stress it um, enough. And I probably mentor, I don't know right now, maybe... 10 students across um, the country and 
I get it, you go like California or bust. Um, but really, and I can be more specific with, with questions if you have um, questions about uh, when you uh, graduate from full sale and what your specific media is, California just doesn't have the work mm. like it used to. It's all up and down. It's pretty much up and down the East Coast. Wow. Yeah. So, so you're in the pre-production stages, you're working with the budget and the scheduling and everything. And then during the film shoot specifically, are you dealing with anything other than that? Or is that just the... Uh, I'm, uh, once we get... Uh, we get through that and they want to go forward, then I start putting the department heads together to working with the director and make sure he gets the, that we get the right department Teams. heads for the film. And that's kind of a process to, because there's a lot of candidates and not a lot of movies these days. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, then I start hiring more people to help. I don't micromanage, I like to delegate because I've got so much on my plate but I'm pretty much in charge of um, putting the crew together. I don't necessarily make all the deals and all of that, but the crew, uh, managing um, the budget, um, the liaison with the studio. And nowadays, legal uh, and filmmaking is a really big component of my job. Um, as uh, all the lawyers that we deal with, with um, every studio. I mean, we have, it's just not entertainment law. It's, there's uh, business affairs, there's labor relations, there's rights, there's music, there's, I mean, there's contracts, there's SAG. There, I mean, there's just so many different attorneys. So I do, I would say half my day is dealt with uh, like you could almost be in any business, mm -hmm. but you could just change around because I'm dealing with the studio and all the, you know, the business of making a movie. And then the other half of the day is getting, you know, the creative and uh, working, you know, with the director. And he usually will have a producer or one or two mm -hmm. that's solely pretty much creative mm. with casting. And I make a lot of cast deals, you know, like the top, the top uh, 10 are with the studio, then I go in behind and mm -hmm. scheduling. And, and how much of that is your, usually your budget? Because um, unless things have changed too much in the last 10 years, it used to be that you know, a large portion of the budget goes to that, that top, the cast, the, the who, you know, is it the? Those, that's changed too. Um, it? You know, it used to be there was, I don't know, I have a handful of actors making 20 million. I, I don't. Like you know, c which they could command, which the, the industry al has allowed them to yeah. command. Um, you'll see that's been a big sea change, and um, everyone seems to be working for different rates depending on. And it's just not the upfront; it's how it's cut on the back um, with um, once the returns come in, and mm. it's a big sea change. And do you kind of oversee that too? Those kind of deals with, with no, that, 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 that studio or yeah. That those are, those are their agents and their gotcha. managers to the upper echelon. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, how has it been for you um, as a woman in this predominantly male industry? Have you found any special challenges? I have. I was looking, okay, how many women are out there? <laughs> There's some women out there. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> um, it, it has. It is a man's world. It's getting a little better, not by leaps and bounds. Um, It, you have to kind of do your job twice as good. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is a challenge. I, 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 I mean, there are certain, I, I think there's a film out there for everyone. And I like to, um, when I hire people on to get the right person. And sometimes it is, uh, depending on what it is and who the cast is and who the director is, you know, to try to balance it out. But it doesn't always work that way. Mm -hmm. um, there's depending. There's a lot of per, a lot of big personalities out there, <laughs> and uh, but it is for, for a woman. It's it's getting better. When I started production managing, probably about 15 years ago, there was only a few of us. Wow. Yeah, I mean that on, on the big shows. Yeah, on the big shows. Um, that's changed, which is good. Um, but it's you know it's hard, and I don't know if it's ever really gonna, you know, be 50 50 mm. um, in the workforce. Right. Yeah. There's, yeah. Yeah. 
So much of the of filmmaking, the physical part of filmmaking, of which you know, which I hear all of you are getting experience of grip and electric and camera and you know, so much of that is a man's world. In in a in a um, uh, every once in a while there would be a like a lone, you know, wolf in there just. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's pretty much you're you're standing on the set, you know, with uh, mostly men. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in uh, in twenty in twenty ten, you won an Emmy for um, outstanding miniseries or motion picture made for television, and it was The Pacific. Mm -hmm. How did it feel to win an Emmy? What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> to stand up on stage. <laughs> was that fun? <laughs> Kind of blur. Um, you know, it's an amazing experience. Uh, I was in Australia for a year, um, and I didn't really want to do the project at first because I was um, my daughter was pretty young. Is my daughter's back there. She <laughs> said hi, um, and it was just the two of us. And I was like, this is a pretty monster deal. Uh, but we decided to go, and so I went to Australia with my three-year-old for a year. Uh, wow. And I'm not sure if any of you have seen the Pacific. Um, it was quite an undertaking. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, it was an extraordinary experience but that came up with an extraordinary cost. Uh, I don't think those kind of projects are really made anymore. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of budget was an enormous amount of money. So that the stress to wake up every morning and uh, just try to get through another day. And plus what we were doing physically, it was mm. pretty dangerous um, out there on a, um, and we had a crew from around the world, England, um, Italy, New Zealand, Australia, US. Um, we had really a, a very international crew. So it was, it was an incredible experience. It's a long time to be that far away yeah. in Australia. Um, and, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm incredibly grateful, and yeah. um, I feel like I've kind of go check. Yeah. You know, because you can work, you know, on all these amazing experiences, but you know, it's just, it's like the, everything's got to perfectly align. So, yeah. it was, and it was with a lovely group of pe people I've, I've known for quite some time. So. Well, it's nice to yeah. be recognized. It you was. Know? It I mean, was lovely. You work yeah. So much and so long, yeah. and it's it's great. It's wonderful. Um, it, you know, that was interesting because we were talking about, it sounds like a lot of the projects have been mostly films, would you say? Yes. And, um, and so when you have worked in television, has it been more of the, of the miniseries or the more well, larger? I've, I've actually, well, I've, I've done a few TV shows a long time ago, and then it was all about features. And um, as a business model in Hollywood these days, um, Television is really the new sweetheart of uh, the media, um, which is a, a bit of a mind trick for all of us who've been, done nothing but uh, feature work. Cause mm. the ki feature has always been a little bit more elite than television. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, I don't know if it's going to shift and reverse itself. Um, the money is in television. Um, the risk is, I mean, that's where all the money is these days. So when you really, d if you just start to Google a little bit, you'll see what's happening. Like all the major um, producing partners and directors are, go are branching out into television. Mm. Um, you know, more of the cable channels, HBO, Showtime. Um, but, you know, they have um, television arms now. Mm -hmm. And so for all of us, kind of diehard feature, um, you know, it is a bit of a, of a twist in um, where the industry is going, but television is kind of the, it's, it's economically, um, that's where the, the business is going. So a broader scope. <laughs> and um, I've really done just one mini series for, uh, for the HBO. I've been in development for several years, which is not my strength. Because I'm usually take the ball a run, and, with it, and yeah. I got kind of caught up in this um, this incredible book called Undaunted Courage, which is um, the story of Lewis and Clark um, <laughs> for HBO, um, and it's produced by Tom Hanks, Brad Pitt, and Edward Norton. Oh wow! And we're a, not an quite there yet. <laughs> it, it will be a mini series for HBO. It won't be on the size of the Pacific, but up there, and it's yeah. been a 
It's been one of these rides in Hollywood. Um, to get it made. To get it made. Um, you would think with that banner, it's, but it's not. It's really about the bottom line. So we're not quite there yet, and there's a weather window to shoot it because everyone knows Lewis and Clark were on the move and outdoors. Mm -hmm. So no stage work, very little, um, and they are on the move. So it's been a real... I was handed a 500-page book. Oh, wow. And so it's been a long time. So <laughs> it's not being made this year, in theory, in 2014, uh, if I'm still doing this. But um, anyway, that's occupied a lot of my time um, in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I haven't done... My last project was a feature film. Yeah. Well, I just want to take a moment and thank you guys again for attending this today and um, for asking great questions and for Cheryl Ann for joining us and sharing her experience and her knowledge. And, um, and yeah, and you guys go out yeah. and make movies, yeah. right? Best of luck. <laughs> thank you.